Welcome to WTA Listens. I'm Shannon Perrine. This morning, we go in depth with the new Allegheny County Executive, Sarah Inamorato. The 37 year old Democrat looks to turn ideas into action, offering her perspective from a new generation of leadership. From representative in the Pennsylvania State House to making history in her home county. So help me God. Congratulations, Madam. Sarah Inamorata was the first woman to hold the office of Allegheny County Executive. The reason I got into public service was one, to be able to ensure that people were viewing the government as a force for good in their lives. She joins me one-on-one -on -one to talk about her plans for Pennsylvania's second largest county. I'm always going to be talking to people because I need to, I always need to know what's going on. I need to have a pulse on what's happening in our neighborhoods if I want to be an effective leader. Plus, we're getting personal, finding out what helped her get to where she is today. It was my work in the nonprofit space and seeing how much wisdom people have in neighborhoods that have been forgotten and left behind by companies and by government for a long time and really just seeing their desire to and commitment to want to make their neighborhoods better and stronger and more connected. And, and her own passion to bring dignity and respect to one of our most vulnerable communities, those experiencing homelessness. These are people who are just trying their best to get back on their feet and, you know, be a part of our community. They are a part of our community and they deserve our attention. During political campaigns, voters do get to learn a little bit about candidates. Now that Sarah Inamorato is the county executive, we wanted to know more about her path to get there. I just want to start with this. You've been through some campaigns. <laughs> During those campaigns, we get to know a little bit yeah. about you. Um, but what, what don't we know about you? What does Allegheny County not know about you that you wish we did know? No, what would I want people to know? I think that, you know, the reason I got into public service was one, to be able to ensure that people were viewing the government as a force for good in their lives. Um, you know, I think like most people, uh, I didn't have a political consciousness. I really didn't know who my local elected leaders were when I was growing up. and. You know, it was through my work directly with the community and the nonprofit space, helping people reclaim vacant land, help people who were food insecure access healthy food. It was, you know, making sure that we could connect technology with nonprofits that were looking to solve great societal problems that through that work, that's how I became exposed to public policy and really our government structures. And so it really comes from a place of, of wanting to do good and wanting to do right by the people that I'm elected to serve. So <clears throat> if, if nothing else, yeah. I want people just to know that I'm, I'm in government because I want it to be you know, something that we can look up to, that we can respect, and that helps make people's lives better. Maybe you can put that in the context of, you talked about trying to solve problems mm -hmm. that sort of led you down the path of elected office. A lot of it had to do with my growing up and, and things that I experienced in my childhood with a you know father who struggled with addiction, um, you know, with my mom and taking my sister and I out of that home and really struggling to find a, a stable place to call mm -hmm. home. Uh, it was my work in the nonprofit space and seeing how much wisdom people have in neighborhoods that have been forgotten and left behind by companies and by government for a long time and really just seeing their desire to and commitment to want to make their neighborhoods better and stronger and more connected and um, you know I'm just so grateful that there are so many people in Pittsburgh and in, throughout this region who want to share their wisdom who want to share their stories and really want to find a way to to be helpful not only for themselves but for their neighbors. Do you have a, is there um, a, a, a person um, that you can think of that you maybe made a difference in their life? I was doing a campaign event out in the, the South Hills area and I had a woman come up to me and say, 
I got selected to be a part of the whole home repair program, wow. which was a bill that I had passed in Harrisburg, and it brought $13 million to our county to help stabilize people's homes and offer repairs when there's no other options available. And, you know, she was older, um, she was aging, and she just said, I never, I never thought that I would be able to do the repairs that I needed to have a high quality of life. And she had tears in her eyes and she was just like, I'm so grateful that you're thinking of us. And that's how I wanna govern. I never wanna be separate from the challenges and problems that are facing people. And I'm gonna always be out in the community. I'm always gonna be talking to people because I need to, I always need to know what's going on. I need to have a pulse on what's happening in our neighborhoods if I wanna be an effective leader. We'll be right back. Welcome back. A big part of county government centers on public safety and criminal justice. When asked what she would change, Allegheny County Executive Sarah Inamorato says she plans to start by listening to the experts. What would a new juvenile detention center, successful juvenile detention center in Allegheny County look like for you? And when could we see that happen? Yeah, so above all else, it's about the the safety and security and well-being of the young people who are in that facility and that requires stringent oversight so whether you know depending on who's operating it whether it's the county whether it's an outside entity that we contract with you know we need to ensure that we have stringent oversight and that we um, I will be creating and reenacting a board that would allow for that oversight that would include community voice, um, experts in the field, and really people who are dedicated to the positive outcomes of the kids who are currently caught up in that system. Are we getting closer to getting that opened? Yes, so, um, you know, it, construction is happening. There is, you know, a contract, um, payments are being made, work is happening. Uh, we still have a lar large part of that facility that um, is undeveloped and we're really trying to work with Department of Human Services and you know outside service providers to say what else can we build here so when kids are in our care that they get right they're required to have education but what else can we give them while they're there um, what else can we show them what other activities can we have what other resources are available not only for them for the, but for their families um, so that you know we're we're really making sure that we're giving them the best chance of success after leaving would it be important for you to meet with Steven Zapala we have met yeah, yeah. and and tell me more about that um, th that um, if you can give us any insight as to what you talked about and mm -hmm. moving forward working with county council i guess you're talking about efficiency but are there any overall big umbrella things that you'd like to see different from mm -hmm. the prosecutor's office yeah so i our first meeting was really about relationship building and really get, getting to know one another and, and what our priorities are and you know in that conversation i think one thing we found where we overlap is there's um diversion court, but it's very expensive to participate in that. So, mm. you know, this is about like low level nonviolent offenses and it's giving people opportunity to not go through the criminal legal system, but rather, you know, have alternative options available for them. Um, the barrier to participate that financially is, is very expensive for people. It can be north of $1,200. So when we're talking about how do we reduce those barriers, we're, I think both of us are interested in considering how we can, you know, make, make, allow more people 
with less means to be able to access programs like that. Everybody's having staffing problems. Yeah. Um, I've heard from others and it, it, people who have been in your shoes in the mm -hmm. past that staffing at the jail is, is challenging. Course. How do you attract great candidates for jail guard positions? Mm -hmm. No, that's really difficult. And we are thinking about it across the entire county because we have more than a thousand open positions across many departments. But you know, you touched on one where we do really need um, staffing at the jail, both um, from correctional officers, but also in the healthcare space. Mm -hmm. That's that's a vital component to to the jail and the services that we can provide to make sure that the residents there are, are um, cared for uh, during their time uh, in the jail. But, you know, I, one of its pay, one of the factors is pay, right? That's always gonna be um, whether people decide to take a job or not, whether they can support themselves and their family. Um, I think with the jail, it's not always just the pay that people are considering, but it's the workplace culture, it's the staff shortages, it's the lack of um, training and um, support that they have. So really, we've, you know, I attended the first jail oversight board meeting. I'm meeting with the jail administration um, once a month to do check-ins. And really, we're trying to figure out how we can create a better workplace at the jail, because we know if we create a better workplace, um, that where people aren't stressed and on edge and they have time to spend outside of the jail, spend time with their, with their families, with their friends and, and be whole people, um, they're gonna be you know, better employees when they're, when they're at the jail. And so we really are a focus, we're focusing on that, that culture piece and that work-life balance. Are you appointing a new superintendent of the county police um, and, and what do you want to see change specifically within that agency? So I do not plan on putting in a new superintendent. Superintendent Kearns has, has been wonderful and getting us up to speed. Um, I was at the Allegheny County Police headquarters uh, a few weeks back. We were celebrating some promotions and a retirement and you know just got a sense to see a sense of their, their operations that they, they have there. Um, you know, I don't, my style of governance is coming in and really sitting with people and understanding. And I've been on the job for, you know, 24 days. So I still have so much to learn. And, you know, what I'm grateful for is, you know, Superintendent Kearns and the folks who work with him that, you know, they're willing to sit, have conversations. We're, we're kind of talking about, um, you know, they're bringing ideas that they have on how they can be more transparent, more accessible to the community. Um, and, you know, we're, we're in conversation right now, but I don't want to dictate. They're the experts. They've been doing this for many decades, and I really want to leverage their expertise to figure out how we can, you know, make sure that Allegheny County Police are ones that are, you know, folks who are highly trained, highly skilled, which they currently are, um, but also that there's more opportunities to interact with community um, and that we can, you know, be more transparent and, and accessible if that's what folks are asking for. More of my conversation with County Executive Sarah Inamorato right after this. Welcome back. During our interview with Allegheny County Executive Sarah Inamorato, we wanted to share with all of you what you can expect to be different. Her answer, that all of us have a part to play in the democracy of Allegheny County. I asked her if she's meeting with the CEOs of the Pittsburgh area's biggest employers, the ones that are for-profit and the ones that are non-profit. Are you going up to the top of these tall buildings in Pittsburgh and <laughs> sitting down at the table with these folks and and, yeah. and chatting yeah. like are you doing that it's a it's a little bit of both right yeah. as far as like are we requesting meetings and they're requesting meetings um 
you know, right now, you know, my primary focus has been building up the team within the county so that when I do go into these meetings, we have the capacity to deliver on whatever we, you know, talk about delivering. So, you know, I've really been prioritizing hiring up and strengthening um, our county workforce and, and really getting the tools and resources that my teams need in order to go out and, and be really strong partners uh, for our industry leaders. But, you know, I've met with a number, um, you know, of, of our large employers, you know, um, Allegheny Health Network with um, PPG, like you mentioned, and you know we'll continue to have have those meetings. Do you want UPMC to give more to nonprofits in the community and give more <laughs> to the county tax base? We really are looking at some of our our large institutions like like UPMC, AHN, um, you know our universities, and it, we would really love to bring everyone to the table and, and figure out how we get them to to pay into the public services that we all benefit from, and you know ones that they especially do so you know that is absolutely on the table and i think that you know we all want to see this region thrive and i i have you know the utmost faith that they will sit down at the table and that we can have a productive conversation i know that people are hungry to share their stories share their ideas and we wanted to create a mechanism for people to do that and you know convening those experts that we have in the nine different issue areas that we're focusing on, um, you know, that allows us to get diverse opinions and expertise at the table to help identify, you know, what can we do in the first 100 days? What can we do in a year? What is a long-term initiative that we have to take on? So, you know, folks can share their ideas if they go to alleghenyforall.com. There's a survey to fill out. Um, please take, you know, you can take 10 minutes, you can take an hour to fill it out. Um, there's, there's a lot of opportunity. We try to encompass everything that we want to focus on, but you know, we'll obviously miss things, but that's why there's open-ended boxes that people can list things that are important to them and their families and their neighborhoods. And you know, that um, we'll be embarking on doing four large-scale community events to engage people in uh, in conversation around what they'd like to see the county's priorities be, because I say that, you know, the community's priorities are the county's priorities, and so we need a place for people to lend their voice. Um, we've seen a lot of success in people um, filling out the survey. Okay. We're really excited people about that. It. They're really doing it. That feels great. What I hear you saying is you want to come in and hear from as many people as possible mm -hmm. about what they want and what's important to them. Absolutely. And, and, that's not going to stop us from taking action. The first day I was in office, you know, the next day after the inauguration, we had a nice party, but then we had to get to work. And the first thing I did was raise the minimum wage for county employees to $18 an hour for full time. Um, and we increased vacation time because it hasn't been, it hadn't been increased since the nineties. And so we went from starting five days to, you know, you start with three weeks of vacation, um, but it also increased the weeks of vacation for senior employees because we wanted to make sure that we were valuing the people who have committed their lives to civil service with the county. Um, and we looked at other ways to remove barriers to access county employment. We immediately, um, allocated an additional $500,000 to the Allegheny County Child Care Matters program. Um, we knew we had families on the wait list for that, and we knew it was really the first time we had talked about it publicly, so we knew more families would be interested in signing up. Um, and by no means is it a universe, we're not solving the problem of affordable child care for our region, but we are signaling that this is one small step forward and we're committed to convening the tables and getting the resources necessary to be able to provide more families child care um, in a variety of creative ways. What would you mm -hmm. say to young people out there or <laughs> parents of young yeah. people who like to <laughs> nag their children about engaging yeah. with government? I would start to say that like government is a reflection of us um, as a people. And so if we don't like what we see, it's our duty to change it. There's a place for you to be involved in the conversation when it comes to government. And, you know, 
that's that's a great place to start because it's a personal passion um, and you know as we see our elected leaders turn over they're getting younger and and with that comes a new mindset of of how to govern and how to be accessible and we're really thinking intentionally at county government of how do we engage young people and get their voices to the table so we're looking at you know, creating a you know a youth council and having young people across this region actually contribute to county government in a meaningful way and, and work on issue areas that they care about and take those skills and knowledge and uh, policies back to their communities to help make a positive difference. We'll be right back. Allegheny County Executive Sarah Inamorato shared with us a recent evening that has nothing to do with policy or high-level meetings. It does have to do with basic shelter for our neighbors. You know, we had a cold burst the last few weeks, and so we were in code blue, which meant that we had emergency shelters open. and. I wanted to see how that process worked. I wanted to look the people in the eye who are using these services that we, we provide and the people who sometimes get vilified um, in the media or, or by you know folks who are downtown and and really get a pulse on like where, where, where who are these people? Where do they come from um, and and how are they using our services? And so I you know spent an evening down at Second Avenue Commons during one of the nights where it was 10 degrees out and, and saw who was in that room. And I would say it's, it was a lot of senior citizens. Mm. And I don't think people think about that. It was a lot of people who were employed and they were asking me, well, when's the bus gonna come back because I need to get to my shift at McDonald's wow. later today or later, you know, early tomorrow. And, you know, we rode the bus up and, you know, everyone was, everyone's respectful, they're grateful. Um, and I want, I want people to know that, that these are people who are just trying their best to get back on their feet and, you know, be a part of our community. They are a part of our community and they deserve our attention. They deserve our dignity and respect. And, you know, I've been back, um, you know, another afternoon to, you know, drop off snacks because when I talk to the workers at Second Avenue Commons, um, this one woman, Heather, who's just absolutely amazing. She probably works 100 hours a week. I asked her what she needed and she didn't say more money or more breaks or more people. She's like, you know, the people here, they'd really love some snacks. And so we brought snacks, you know, and, and there's so much more we can do, but, you know, I just, I want people to know that, that we are, the people who are doing the work are doing the best they can to serve this population of people and the people who are using those services, who are homeless, who are housing insecure, they're our neighbors. And it could be any one of us at any point in our lives. And, you know, let's do our best to treat them with dignity and respect and let's help them out. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. No matter where you live in the Pittsburgh area, we want to hear from you. You can send us an email at wtaelistens at hearst.com. Thanks for joining us and have a great week.